Hey guys, Tyler here. I've covered quite a few alien species on this channel, both from Star Trek and non-Star Trek properties alike. I try to explore each species' biology, how they differ from humans, what their evolutionary history might have been like, and how they compare to our expectations about aliens in real life. But while many of these alien species share certain biological characteristics, one question has remained constant across all depictions. How is it that so many of these alien species are able to interbreed? As audience members, we often take this for granted, but realistically, interspecies reproduction should be much more complicated. Franchises like Mass Effect generally do a better job at this, in my opinion, explaining how differences in amino acids can make everything from interspecies relations to even just sharing food incredibly risky. But in Star Trek in particular, how does interspecies reproduction actually work? How do doctors bridge the gap between what's possible with and without medical intervention? And is it actually more plausible than we might suspect? Let's find out. Most, if not all, humanoid life in Star Trek's Milky Way shares a common ancestor. As we learn in the Next Generation episode, The Chase, approximately four and a half billion years ago, a humanoid species called the Progenitors seeded the primordial oceans of many Earth-like worlds with a genetic code that would direct evolution towards a form similar to their own. This is why humans, Klingons, Romulans, Cardassians, and lots of other species more or less share the same basic body plan. Even before TNG, the original series explained an abundance of humanoid alien species through parallel or convergent evolution. TOS and the prequel series Enterprise gave the concept of parallel or convergent evolution on alien worlds the more sci-fi sounding name Hodgkin's Law of Parallel Planetary Development. But isn't there a good Hodgkin's and a bad Hodgkin's? Even as life forms evolved on planets separated by dozens, hundreds, or even thousands of light years, their DNA was found to be strikingly similar, pointing towards the possibility of a shared origin. This is a bit of an oversimplification, but the point is, in Star Trek, astrobiologists have confirmed time and time again after contact with various alien species that there are many shared traits across planets and cultures. And eventually it was confirmed that these ecosystems all got a bit of a jump start from the same source. Even the revelation of potential parallel evolution in the 21st century would quickly lead many to reconsider the compatibility of human and alien DNA. And by the 23rd century, we see examples of living adult alien human hybrids such as Spock. But before we go any further, it's prudent to ask the question, what is it that real-world astrobiologists have to say today about interspecies reproduction? Well, just as in numerous other scientific fields, the experts are divided. Some astrobiologists believe that extraterrestrials are more likely to look like insects, or even better, robots since primates are only one order from which intelligence could arise. Interspecies relations would thus be a hard sell, unless you're into that thing. Given the evolutionary hurdles that life had to jump through to give rise to humans, many astrobiologists believe that the majority of alien life forms would look nothing like us, not even like other animals on Earth. Different environmental pressures would arguably lead to different body plans, such as a centaur-like stature, or major sensory organs being located near the feet rather than near the top. Indeed, the completely bizarre life forms that evolved here on Earth during the Cambrian explosion approximately 541 million years ago include animals with five eyes, backwards facing mouths on their underside, and a clawed proboscis extending from the front of their face. Cambrian predators were, in many ways, more alien than modern day arthropods. However, some astrobiologists believe that the humanoid form may be more likely to occur than we would initially expect. And this makes some sense, right? I mean, while our bodies are definitely not perfect in an evolutionary sense, since there's no such thing, some traits may emerge as being more optimal across 
different planets. These include bipedalism, freeing up a set of limbs for tool making, forward-facing eyes and other major sensory organs on a head atop our torso, optimal for predation, and perhaps other traits such as verbal communication, emotional intelligence, and cooperation, forming the basis of a civilized society. And because sexual reproduction is expected to arise independently across different environments on different planets, then aliens would at least have sexual attraction among themselves. Of course, as is made clear in Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, Not everybody keeps their genitals in the same place, Captain. Regardless of the frequency of humanoid aliens in real life, we're, we're probably alone in the galaxy, to be honest. In Star Trek, it's clear that there are thousands of intelligent humanoid alien civilizations. So, what does this tell us? Well, while all the basics may be there in terms of body plan, what's on the inside may be more of a deal breaker. As I alluded to earlier in Mass Effect, some species biology is based on dextro amino acids as opposed to the more dominant levo amino acids, meaning that the sharing of things like food and well, bodily fluids can be fatal. In Star Trek though, most humanoid alien life seems to share the same basic protein structures, at least as far as we're aware. But how do they overcome other differences between species in order to reproduce? Despite so many shared biological traits, the carbon-based molecular makeup, same body plan, etc., interspecies reproduction in Star Trek is still not simple. Because of the complications that can arise from interspecies breeding, it is a deeply researched topic. There's even a semester-long course at Starfleet Academy on interspecies protocol with a heavy emphasis on personal relationships and reproduction. But even sexual encounters between seemingly compatible species, such as humans and bullions, aren't as straightforward as they might seem. Human alien embryos are far from guaranteed to survive due to various genetic defects that could arise, as well as dangers to the mother before or during birth. And again, this isn't entirely surprising. So how do they fix it? For species who cannot reproduce naturally for one reason or another, genetic engineering technology can be used to ameliorate most issues. In fact, this may be the case with the vast majority of interspecies reproduction in Star Trek. Now you might be asking, isn't genetic engineering banned in the Federation? And the answer is yes, but it's always been understood that this mainly refers to uh, genetic enhancements and straight-up eugenics, such as the augmenting of certain individuals to express uh, superior characteristics. <laughs> While Earth had its eugenics wars in the 20th and 21st centuries, other species, such as the Denobulans, more or less perfected genetic engineering technology by the mid-22nd century without having to endure a genocidal conflict of their own. In the Enterprise two-parter Demons and Terra Prime, we learn that uh, a xenophobic Earth-based terrorist faction has taken DNA from Florida man Trip Tucker and Vulcan science officer to Paul in order to create a binary clone. The infant ultimately dies due to genetic complications, but according to Phlox, the method used to combine the DNA was flawed, meaning that with extra careful attention given to the cloning process, there's no reason that a human and a Vulcan could not have a child. And again, as I mentioned earlier, we see this borne out in the 23rd century with Spock. By the 24th century, we see hybrid offspring of lots of different species, including humans and Katarians, Cardassians and Kazon, Cardassians and Bajorans, Klingons and Trill, Klingons and Romulans, Klingons and humans, damn, Klingons must be a pretty popular mate, must be the two well, you know. For sex. But despite their evolution in completely separate biospheres, these species' shared genetic ancestry is arguably the primary reason they're able to interbreed in the first place. They must share similar numbers of chromosomes, similar enzymes, and other basic ingredients for a successful pregnancy, whether the gestation lasts nine months or a different period of time, and genetic engineering helping to reduce some of the complications between otherwise incompatible elements of alien biology 
is a key piece of the puzzle as well. This could also explain why many of these hybrid offspring are not infertile. In Earth biology, interspecies reproduction almost always leads to offspring that cannot reproduce themselves, but advanced genetic engineering could assist in addressing this problem too. But this brings me to yet another question. Even if we establish that interspecies reproduction is possible and can point out numerous examples of it, why are these examples so frequent among the bridge crews of various prominent Starfleet ships? The reason I ask is that while galactic commerce and diplomacy would obviously be factors that encourage members of different species to intermarry, it seems like more than a coincidence that almost every Star Trek show has at least one hybrid character as part of the main bridge crew. The original series has Spock, of course, a human-Vulcan hybrid, The Next Generation has Deanna Troy, a human-Betazoid hybrid, and Voyager has Belana Torres, a human-Klingon hybrid, and Naomi Wildman, a human-Katarian hybrid. Seven of Nine is basically a Borg-human hybrid, depending on your semantic preferences. Technically, Benjamin Sisko is half-human, half-prophet, and a deleted scene from Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan would have revealed that Lieutenant Savage is actually half Vulcan, half Romulan, although those two species' common ancestor is only a couple thousand years old. Notably though, every show since Enterprise seems not to feature a hybrid main character, though that said, Michael Burnham did spend her formative years being raised on Vulcan. Why are there so many hybrids? Well, in-universe, it could be because of the nature of Starfleet itself. Despite being the Federation's primary exploration organization, Starfleet is still rather human-dominated. Starfleet Academy's main campus, as well as the Federation Council and Office of the President, are all located on Earth. Most Starfleet captains we meet are human. Most Starfleet admirals we meet are human, and idiots at that. Lots of Starfleet ships are built in the Sol system. Starfleet being an outgrowth of Earth's military is one of the biggest open secrets of the franchise, in my opinion. So it stands to reason that at least some alien Starfleet officers with one human parent would make it onto the command staff of various Starfleet ships. And there may be even more in junior positions. Out of universe, it makes for interesting internal conflict as these hybrid characters try to navigate the difficulties of balancing their two halves. In-universe, it seems to be a statistical inevitability. So, who's your favorite hybrid character in Star Trek? And could you see yourself pursuing a relationship with a member of an alien species? Be honest. Let me know down in the comments. As always, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support my work even further, becoming a patron or a member is a great way to do so. Links to those, as well as my social media and merch store, are in the description. That's all I have for this week. Live long and prosper.